kind of wanted to um, give a, a little bit of a brief uh, recap. So, okay, so far what's mm -hmm. happened is we have this prophet who's having this this conversation between him and God, and um, basically God's giving him bad news. You know, hey, y you think it's bad now with all these evil people, you know, getting getting away with it, basically. Uh, there's going to be even worse people to come by. <laughs> so after this whole dialogue between him and God, um, which is all posted on Facebook, um, we get to chapter 3, which is basically a, a song that Habakkuk uh, writes. And that's how he kind of uh, resolves the situation, I guess. Um, so just a few things before we go to the question. One of the things that it, we pointed out it, from chapter 2 is it said about how the righteous people will live by faith. And a, a few things I wanted to kind of point out from, from the implications in the wider context of Habakkuk. Prideful, prideful people are usually seen, whereas righteous people are usually overlooked. Um, don't be surprised if you're doing the right thing and you don't get noticed for it. Don't, don't, don't be surprised that that happens. Uh, prideful people seem to not get what's coming to them, and righteous people seem to suffer unjustly. That's just something that seems to happen sometimes. Once again, we talked about this before. Don't get too bent in our shape about what God's doing in someone else. You know, uh, prideful people are usually their own authority. They don't submit to other people. Righteous people are under God's authority. Uh, prideful people live by what they feel and see. Righteous people live by what's unseen. That right there is probably the most difficult part of all of it, is having to uh, believe in something when you when you don't feel it, when you don't see anything happening, and still choosing to live by that. Um, a few more things. In Habakkuk 2.20, it says about how you know idols are, are, are not uh, beneficial um, because you know they, they're just made and they're created and whatnot. And the idea here is that God is contrast with those dead idols. So although the idols don't, don't speak, God was actually present with his people and in, 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 in the temple. But also another thing that, it, that it's um, – so God has real presence speaking. Okay, but then another thing that's talking about is it says that God speaks from His temple. Now, in the heart of the temple was the Ark of the Covenant, which in the in the Ark of the Covenant was the law. So one thing that 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 He is obviously alluding to is that the Ten Commandments were in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so in other words, God has spoken through the Bible. I think that's kind of an important point that Habakkuk is saying. That sometimes I, I, I just don't think we quite get that. Like, okay, we want God to speak to us, yeah, but then when it comes to, well, the Bible, we kind of, well, you know, and I'll kind of read that so you see what I'm saying. But the earth is, uh, but the Lord is in his holy temple, that all the earth be silent before him. And if you back up to verse 18, it says, What profit is the idol when its maker has carved it? Or an image, a teacher, or falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork. So in contrast with this idol that's not doing anybody any good, is uh, God who is who is speaking. So based off of our study of Philippians, Job, and Habakkuk, two important questions, and I just want to see if anybody wants to answer either of the questions, uh, preferably those who have been here for uh, at least parts of Philippians, Job, and Habakkuk. Um, what has been most helpful for you when you're going through a hard time that we've looked at? Or in what ways have you learned to help others in hard times from what we've looked at? God is aware. Like we, we sometimes feel like you know he's turned away or he's he's not aware of the situation, but but he is aware of it. Yeah, especially in Habakkuk, real strong. Yeah, real strong. Zach, did you have anything? Nicole. You were here for most of it. Pretty much send the truck stuff. He knows mm -hmm. what's going on. And Did you find any of it applicable with the situation with Jamie? Yeah. It's just like. Especially like kind of with the cancer. Uh huh. It's just like. We sometimes have the tendency to blame God for what we're going through. But it's like he knows. It's yeah. Just like he can be using it to strengthen my faith, and I kind of use that to 
loosely. No, I know. I'm I... using it, but uh, I and I've seen this with her that it's that she her strength her faith is getting stronger for whatever. Mm. Because she's wanting to Which is good. Her. Which is very good. But then there's some things that she's just like can't do it. <laughs> but I've definitely seen it with her and I've learned how to you know, help her through it more. And kind of what to do. Well good. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go into, into chapter 3 then. So first off, verse 1 says, a prayer, to, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigayanoth. Now that's a big fancy word that basically means it's a type of poem. A Shigayanoth is a type of poem. Uh, a what? Hebrew poem. So like, you know, we have different kinds of, of po poetry in English. It's, it's a type of poetry in, in Hebrew. Um, I think there's actually another one in that same style that's in the book of Psalm. I'm not positive about that. Another another two quick things um, is uh, it is uh, this poem was written as a prayer. It says a prayer of Habakkuk. And then the second thing is that th this type of poem is kind of like a lament. So um, you're going to put that away somewhere. <laughs> Verse 2, uh, Lord, I have heard the report about you and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So here we have kind of a, a, a surprise. Is, you know, Habakkuk has been kind of, you know, God, I don't understand how you're doing this. And here we have, you know, God's given him the answer and everything. And, and it's not something that he's, he's he, he wants. But then he's he comes to this point of, of just saying, you know, I'm not arguing with you. I, I'm accepting. He's not protesting. You know, God has told him this terrible thing that's going to happen, and, and he's not protesting. He's just he's acknowledging it. You know, okay. His response was fear. So it, you know, once again, it's okay. You know, sometimes we feel like if, if we get afraid of something, it's not okay. It's it is a totally natural reaction. Uh, his response was fear, um, but it was also to ask God to proceed with His punishment of Judah and destruction of Babylon. We deserve it, and Your ways are good. It's okay. You, this is what you're going to do? Okay. All right. I know we deserve it. But then he ends with this. In wrath, remember mercy. So go ahead and do what, you're, what you said you, you're, you're going to do, God. Just don't forget mercy on account of your wrath. And then we get to verse 3. It says, uh, God comes from Teman and the Holy uh, One from Mount per uh, Paran. His splendor – now it says there in the middle of, the, uh, in the middle of this verse, it says uh, Selah. That's basically uh, – they figure it's a musical refrain uh, in Hebrew. Um, I'm not really going to spend a whole lot of time about that. So basically it's, it's the idea of stop and think about this. You know, um, His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. So the imagery here is um, – it's, it's how God revealed himself at Mount Sinai. If you compare uh, Habakkuk chapter 3 with Moses' song in Deuteronomy chapter 33 or 31 or whatever – um, you, you're going to find a lot of similar wording. Um, Habakkuk probably used Moses' prayer as you know the foundation for what he's writing here. Um, and so when he says uh, um, God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Mount Paran uh, these, this is the area around where the law was given. And a lot of his imagery that he's going to he's going to refer to here is going to refer back to the book of Exodus when God reveals Himself on Mount Sinai. Uh, his radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand, and there is the hiding of his power. So here we have quite a few things that are being said. Um, first off, hand is, is – is, think of um, power in in older – or not in older. In Hebrew writing, the, the hand is kind of symbolic of, of power. So for God's right hand, that would be his, his strength. Um, <clears throat> So here we have quite a few different things. First off, his radiance is like the sunlight. He, ha he has rays flashing from his hand. So the first image is kind of like the sun rays. His glory is so bright that it conceals his power. Um, because it says here he, he has rays flashing from his hand, and there, there is the hiding of his power. But then the second thing that he's, he's saying here, um, at Sinai, he concealed his power because if he would have revealed himself totally, it would have killed uh, Israel. And then the third thing that he's saying here is God uses nature to conceal his power rather than outright revelation. And that may, he makes it absolutely clear uh, later on. Um, so now, verse 5, uh, before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. This is a reference to the plagues of Egypt and also the plagues uh, in the wilderness after Egypt. 
He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. So here, oh, I'm sorry, verse 7 as well. I saw the tents of Kushan, Kushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. It's okay if you don't know ancient geography. That's totally fine. His main point here is just uh, God's presence is so great that it shakes, that the earth shakes before him. Um, the report scared Canaan and the surrounding area. If you remember in the book of uh, uh, Joshua and all that, uh, uh, they they had heard about what God did and it scared them. Now let's see what else. Uh, even in the uh, also another thing that he's saying here is if you he said um, the perpetual mountains were shattered. So mountains are often off symbolic of the strength or, or strong people. Um, even the mighty are scared before God, especially relevant because of the coming Babylon superpower. So basically, in light of Babylon, this big scary world power that's going to come and, and and crush, you know, God's might is mightier than Babylon might, basically. Um, so then in verse 8, uh, Did the Lord rage against the rivers, or was your anger against the rivers, or was your wrath against the sea, that you rode on your horses on your chariots of salvation? Now this is obviously um, a, an allusion to um, how God parted the waters. He parted the waters for Joshua as they were coming in. He parted the waters for, for Moses. Also, it's contrasting Pharaoh's chariots with God's chariots. If you look here, it says that, that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation. So obviously, you know, you think of Babylon, this big power with all of their army and stuff, and you have God saying, hey, I'm coming with my chariots. And also, and also if you notice, uh, he's using the, the idea that the water, how God parted the water is like, is like God's chariots because it came crashing on Pharaoh's chariots. Um, okay, so the next part, uh, your bow was made bare. The, roads of the rods of chastis chastisement were sworn, and then we have another sailor there. You cleaved the earth with rivers. Um, so here we have the idea um, of quite a few different things. Um, the mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of waters swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. So here, just in summary, just so that we don't spend too much time on this, he's referencing um, storms. He's referencing the, the time of the flood. He's referencing the time of creation. He's referencing the time of the Israelite conquest. And he's referencing uh, Israel's experience at Sinai. So he's kind of taking all these things that God has done, kind of combining them into one, uh, one singular uh, moment of praise, if you will. Never saw that before. No. Yeah, well, yeah, and like, chapter three was one of those things that I really had a hard time understanding. So that's why I, I, did, I worked so hard to break down every single part is because I figured if I can't understand what the heck's being said here, how is anybody else going to understand that? And the idea here is that um, you have read chapter three. So if you have not read chapter three, don't be concerned. Go read chapter three and then rewatch this. and It'll make a lot more sense. Um, OK, so then that takes us to verses 12 to 15. Uh, in indignation you marched through the earth, in anger you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. Now, in this context, your anointed is Israel. Um, your anointed in the Old Testament can mean lots of different things. It can mean, it can mean the coming Messiah, so Jesus. It can mean, uh, obviously, Israel. Uh, it can mean uh, the prophet. Um, it can mean a lot of different things. But in this context, your anointed is Israel. Uh, you struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. And then we have another spirit. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed into scatters. Their exultation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses on the, sur on the surge of many waters. So here we have again the clear emphasis that the waters are God's chariots. How he covered Pharaoh's chariots with the water. The water is God's chariots. So yeah, it says there, um, you trampled on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. See, what, what's this? What's God's chariot? The waters. Okay, so uh, God's trampling of Egypt and Canaan and the coming trampling. So it, basically, just because my note really doesn't make sense, so let me kind of break it down. Um, he's referencing God's coming trampling, the, basically the day of the Lord that's yet to come, the end times. But then the other thing that he's referencing is the work that he did uh, against Egypt and against Canaan uh, in the past. So Habakkuk's main point here is that God has done something great. He will do something great again. God, you know, God established something. He he uh, he hasn't forgotten us. He didn't forget us then. So he's kind of just drawing the drawing the um, connection between, hey, we are oppressed now. We're going to be opp oppressed by Babylon, and we were oppressed back then by Egypt, 
and you brought us through that. So now when, when we're going to be oppressed here in a little bit, as we are being oppressed right now, you're going to bring us through that too. It's kind of a, a contrast. So uh, verse 13, though, I want to kind of um, point this out. It says, you went forth for the salvation of your people, uh, for the salvation of your anointed, you struck the head of the house of the evil. So in other words, he is not doing this just for poos and, poos and giggles. He's not just being mean to people. He's causing this destruction. He's causing this punishment because of wickedness. Jerusalem refused to humble themselves before God. They kept living in sin. They kept living their own way. And they were going to get punished because they were not listening to God. But then also, uh, Babylon was going to get their punishment too because they weren't any more righteous. <laughs> Um, okay, and then in verse 14, notice how he, he points out that he's one of them. Uz, you pierced with his own spears the head of the, of the strong. They stormed in to scatter us, not them. Habakkuk uh, refers to himself as part of, part of Israel. And if you notice on the prophets, it's an often repeated thing. It's not me versus them. I'm righteous, they're not. It's us. Like, for instance, Isaiah says the exact same thing when he says, hey, I'm unclean, and I also live among the people who are unclean. Like, there's there's no cleanliness going on here that, that you should, you know. Anyways, uh, so then uh, those who tried to destroy others would see their efforts returned on them, like how the Egyptians died in their pursuit of Israel. If you remember, e Egypt or Israel was free. They were leaving. Egypt said, hey, that's not good enough. I'm going to go destroy them. And then in their attempts to destroy Israel, they ended up dying in the water. So if you look here, it says... Uh, um, you pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in to scatter as their exaltation was like those who devoured their press in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses. So, okay. Uh, they were gloating, presuming that they would squash oppressed Israel. And here we have a little bit of a play on words. So, oppressed Israel in this context, it's not clear whether he's talking about how they've been, how they're oppressed by sin or how they're um, oppressed by, their, by the enemy nations. It, and it's not clarified. I think the reason why it's not is because it's both. Um, so I would just put yes, because it's yes, in both and. Um, okay, uh, so then the last parts here of this chapter, verse 16, I heard and my inward parts trembled at the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to rise who will invade us. So here, uh, once again, he points out that he has, he has this fear. He, he just completely terrified. You know, sometimes we think that we're not supposed to feel fear. Everybody feels fear. It's what you do with the fear. That's that's the thing. Um, so obviously this is especially frightening because it's a lose-lose situation, and it cannot be diverted. It's going to happen, and he just has to pretty much wait for it to happen, which must have been terrifying. <laughs> Babylon was not a very nice people. They were they were very mean. <laughs> uh, uh, right? Like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on out of here. Um and I already mentioned that, so I don't need to do that again. Uh, then verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should f uh, fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the field, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. Now let me stop here and just kind of point something out. In the law, it was given with a condition. If you do blank, I will do blank. If you follow my commands that I give you today, I will bless you. I will give you your crops. I will. I will withhold uh, diseases and pestilence from you. You won't get sick. Your you, your kids. You you won't have miscarriages. You, and everything will be going great. Now, once again, that uh, that promise doesn't apply to us. That applied to Israel, and that covenant was put away. We will have those things, no matter how righteous we are. Um, okay. So, but then here, what he's saying basically is, though, we aren't seeing the fruit of the covenant that that those good things that you promised in the covenant that we aren't seeing that i'm still going to praise you because ultimately we aren't seeing that because it's our own fault um so then in in verse 18 again i will rejoice in the god of my salvation the lord god is my strength and he has made my feet like hind's feet uh another translation says uh, like deer feet um uh, and maker uh, and makes me walk on my high places um so let's just kind of take this apart. Oh my goodness. That's no no no, that's my alarm. It tells me, "Hey, you better shut up." <laughs> so that way I don't go too long. Um in the face of the coming destruction, the prophet will worship God, which is honestly sometimes we feel like we have to get our act together to worship God. But here's the thing, worship if it doesn't cost us anything 
isn't worship. Worship has to cost us something. David clicked into this when he went to um, give a sacrifice to God, and the guy said, here, just take the field and, and make your sacrifice. He said, I'm not going to give God a sacrifice that costs me nothing. And we see that same, same idea repeatedly throughout Scripture. And the idea is this. Worship has to cost us something. So when you don't feel like it, when you feel down in the dumps, when, when you don't have, feel like you have your act together, that's when worship is all the more important because it costs you something. It means you don't have anything to give and you're still giving something to God. That's when it matters most. If you have your act together and you're doing everything great and you think you're just the cat's meow, what good is that to God? That's a, that's a, that's a prideful heart. What's he going to do with that? You think God needs your goodness? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so I already mentioned that. He's referencing the blessing of the covenant. Hey, if you do this, you'll do this. So even though we failed, even though you're punishing us because we failed, I'm still going to worship you. Um, and one thing that Habakkuk kind of repeats is, yes, we do deserve this. We do deserve this. He says this like three times in the thing. You know, go ahead and do what you've said. You know, he, he doesn't have an argument as to how they don't deserve it. Now, notice at the beginning of the book what he said. How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out for you to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? At the beginning of the book, man, he's on cloud nine. I'm righteous and these people aren't. Why aren't you hearing my righteous prayer and everything? Well, here at the end of the book, he's like, yep, we deserve it. You notice how I said that? Us. We. He, it, the complete shift of the prophet has changed. At the beginning of the book, he was a righteous and everybody else was not righteous. At the end of the book, yeah, we deserve it. You know, he's not even giving like some retort like, okay, these sinners deserve it, but I'm right. I'm your prophet. I, you should save me. He doesn't give any of that kind of nonsense. In the light of God's revelation of what he's doing and who he is, it left Habakkuk with no defense. Just like in the book of Job, throughout the whole book of Job, Job is you know, talking about his righteousness and how he should be able to prove himself. And all that. And then at the end of the book, what is he saying? I have no defense. I spoke out of line. Completely forget everything that I said. I was totally wrong. Just like in Philippians, you know, again, we're, we're looking at the, the same theme repeated over and over again. We're looking at pain. We're looking at suffering. We're looking at the, at the persecution of the righteous. Um, so typically the sign of a god conquering another, conquering another god was when that god was conquered in war. In that sense, most uh, war in the ancient world was um, a holy war. You know, I know a lot of people make a big deal about the holy war in the medieval ages, but holy war in the ancient world was it was a common occurrence. If one city beat another city, well, then that, the patron god, the, the god of that city, was being proven as more more uh, powerful than the god of that other city. So this is just how things work. So for for Babylon. They could easily believe that Yahweh was inferior to Marduk, or Molech. No, Marduk. Yeah, I had that right. Marduk. Uh, they could easily believe that because they conquered. Surely if the other god was more powerful than their god, that he wouldn't have let them be conquered. But in this case, God was using the politics and nature for his own good. Now, that was beyond Babylon's understanding because, you know, gods weren't that personal. And not only that, but gods weren't god Gods were like people, just a little bit stronger. They thought like people, they acted like people, they weren't all powerful, you could fool them, they got tired, all that stuff. So Yahweh is completely different from all the other people's idea of God. And, uh, yeah. So Babylon couldn't brag because God was in control and not them. They should have paid attention because these prophecies were given before Babylon conquered. And then they went in and conquered, and they didn't listen to the prophecies. Had they listened to the prophecies, they would have gone in a little more humbly. <laughs> I think so, at least. Because in one of the prophecies, he says, I told you to go and destroy them, but you did worse than I told you to do. So that kind of tells me that Babylon really was just their own boss. In fact, that's exactly what Habakkuk says. Um, so Babylon couldn't brag that they beat Jerusalem because God was the one in control and not them. He caused them to rise to their power. He caused them to beat Jerusalem. Just a few more things. Uh, if you look, it said about how in verse 3 it says, God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. So God comes from this high place. And now he says, and he would lift up the prophet to the high place. Look how, how it ends. And makes me walk on my high places. So just as God is, is you know, coming in power, he's going to lift me from my lowly state. 
Um, so during the bad times, he would lift him up. Th this very closely resembles Isaiah's message when he says um, in chapter 40 um, that he will renew their strength. Um, uh, also, there's another contrast here. He's referenced quite a few times how scared he is, how he's shaking. But then here he says, but God strengthens him. So I have no strength. Here's my strength. I have none of it. Here's God carrying me along with my lack of strength. Um, there's really a lot of contrast out here. and In fact, I didn't, but you can go through and read chapter 1 and 2 and then compare it with a song, and you find a lot of references in chapter 3 to chapter 1 and 2. I didn't do that because that would have made this take way longer than it already is taking. So, uh, Anyways, um, another another kind of point here is that contentment is found in God. It's not found in, 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 in the blessings of life. You know, hey, even if even if I lose all these things, I'm still going to exalt in the Lord. It's not caused in everything going right because he just kind of clarified that. Even in when everything is going wrong, I'm still going to praise you. Even when I am being punished, I'm still going to praise you. You know, whatever, I'm still going to praise you. So contentment is found in God. This is a, a theme that Paul picks up on and writes about in Philippians, which takes us back to Philippians. See how it all connects? The, these three books just so wonderfully complement each other. Um God made the prophet sure-footed. If you look in chapter 19, it's, I mean, verse 19, and he has made my feet like hind's feet. Um, a hind, once again, that's like a deer kind of. So think of them as being fast. Think of them as being sure-footed. You know, they, they, when they're running at night, they, they don't run into trees. They, they see where they're going. When they're climbing up like hills, they don't trip over themselves. You think of that. Um, so God has, has made the prophet walk their feet like hind's feet. Um so he struggled, Habakkuk struggled, but through it all he was trusting, which brings us back to that statement, the righteous will live by faith. We see it right here. We think, if I'm having any doubts, if I'm having any emotional struggles, if, I'm, if I don't have it all together, if I have moments of maybe not believing that God is as good as he says that he is, that means my faith is completely ransacked. It's just completely pointless. No, Habakkuk had that exact same problem. He was struggling just like we do. But with that struggle, he still said, hey, I'm going to praise you in the midst of it. You're still worthy. And did you see how long, how much space of his song was spent just with glorifying God for what he had done and what he was sure that he would do in the future? He really emphasized God's power. Look at this. And he goes verse after verse, um, starting in verse in verse 3. God comes from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens, His earth is, um, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He keeps going on and on about just worshiping God. He spent all this time with that. Which brings us to another thing of how you get through a hard time. Glorify God, not the problem. Philippians alluded to it. Job alluded to it. Here we have a clear statement, a clear example. Glorify God, not the problem. Because what we do is we make our problems too big. And then God can't possibly answer them because they're bigger than they actually are. Man, we make our problems as though they are a God in and of themselves, a God of destruction that can't be fought against. But that's because we get too close to it. If we actually just look at things and how they are, there's never anything too big for God. It's our imagination that makes something too big for God because we sit there thinking about it rather than sitting there worshiping God. Um, okay, what else? I know I had other points I wanted to make. Habakkuk shadowed his fear of what was coming with the greatness of God. I already pointed that out. God is bigger than this. So imagine you were waiting for national destruction. Hey, America is going to be destroyed by ISIS in just a few years. Everything's going to go to crap. It's going to be terrible. Um, yeah, yeah. And this is happening because because y'all keep living in sin. And you won't repent. You won't say sorry. You won't turn from your wickedness. You just keep living in sin. So this is what's going to happen. And there's nothing you can do to divert it. Oh, imagine how terrifying that is. Life as you know it is going to be changed. This is a very terrifying thing. Um, but however, God is still bigger than that thing. So God is Lord of nature and uses it to show himself. This was a big reveal. Because like, for instance, uh, a storm god would be just that. A, a god of a storm. So he would speak in like a storm. Okay. But he was limited. In, in contrast, we have God here in control of nature. And he's using it to show his glory. Um, also, this is, it references the, the coming Messiah and the coming day of the Lord. I don't want to get off on that. I feel like it's a rabbit trail. Um, when enemies surround to mock you and tear you down, they are really only hurting themselves. That's another 
obvious application from what we just read. And then uh, the last point, when Belshazzar was overthrown, he was the last king of um, Babylon. Well, technically he was the co-king, but that's not really relevant. God had set up his punishment before it happened, and when he used the holy utensils, it justified God's punishment. So basically, here we have the last king of Babylon. I'm just breaking down what I said there in case you're not, not aware. Don't, don't feel stupid. Um, I, it was a poorly written note. It's my fault. Um, so Babylon is about to fall, and the the last king uh, decides, hey, you know what? I'm going to get these utensils uh, that that are dedicated to the Lord. They were the ten utensils that that Babylon took from the temple in Jerusalem, and he's going to party with them and use them for his dr drunken party. So not a really great idea. And actually, if you read in Daniel, it doesn't end very well. That same night, God writes on the word, uh, I mean, writes some words on the wall, and that very night, uh, Persia takes over Babylon. That that very same night. Um, in fact, Babylon pretty much just opened the doors and there was no fight. Persia just marked in, uh, marched in and took over. Um, anyways, uh, but God had set up that punishment that was due to Belshazzar and Babylon all the way back here before Babylon even rose to full power. So, God, aren't you judging someone before they actually did something? No, for two reasons. First off... They had been too cruel to Israel, more than God had told them to be. Second reason is because God didn't, although God knew that that very night Persia was going to take over, Babylon didn't. So while Babylon is sitting there partying, they used God's holy utensils and justified what Persia was about to do. So although God already planned the destruction because he knew what Babylon was going to do, the destruction didn't come for what was going to happen, it came for what did happen. God just aligned it out so that there wasn't a real big span of wait and see. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of Habakkuk. I'm sorry this lesson was a little bit long. I, I know it was, and I knew it was. I just didn't want to spend any longer. We've been in Habakkuk since May, guys. And it's only been five lessons in, of Habakkuk. Five lessons. But it took us since May. Yeah, but we missed one. That's what I'm saying. Like, it took us way too long. We're only a five-week lesson. Like, geez. So I really didn't want to make this last note of the night. Were there any questions or comments about Habakkuk before we go to prayer?